Well, once again, my sisters and brothers, it's good to be with you. It's hard to believe that we're now halfway through the season of Lent and hoping uh, for you that this is uh, proving to be a time of grace for you, that it's a, a time of, uh, of joy, that you're uh, finding uh, Jesus more deeply in your own life through your prayer, fasting, and good works, and uh, so glad that you're a part of this journey with us, especially as we celebrate these live stream masses uh, on Sunday. You know, I, I doubt that I'm the only one uh, who is thinking about the NFL right now. You know, uh, any time that uh, you and I have an opportunity to, to watch football games during the football season uh, from the NFL, there will always be uh, somebody uh, in the stands who is holding up a sign that reads John 3.16. John 3.16. Uh, it comes from the gospel that we've just heard, and the words uh, from 3.16 are these. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Isn't it neat that that tradition has grown up that somebody holds up a sign like that at a football game? But you know, as I've been praying over the scripture passage for today, and as I think about my life, and I know as you are thinking about your life, isn't it true that a sign like that needs to be lifted up more than just at a football game? And isn't it true that a sign like that needs to be lifted up not, not just as one verse by, by one person, but all of us who bear the name of Christ should become living signs of that message. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Isn't that true? It's an invitation for us as Christians to be able to reflect the person of Jesus Christ. There's a need for all of us you know, to come out of obscurity, if you will, in our day-to-day -day lives and make sure that we're, we're proud of our faith and that people will know that we belong to Christ and will know that we, in fact, are, are good Christians. You know, it's good for us to be able to take a look at, uh, at, at where we are on that scale and, and how much we're living billboards of Jesus Christ as we take a look at this particular gospel from John. You know, one of the things about John, who was the best buddy of Jesus, the fourth evangelist, is that uh, he truly believed that faith is an active state. Faith is something that needs to be lived in. And you know, if you take a look at the first half of, of John's gospel, John's gospel is divided into two parts. The book of signs and the book of glory. The book of signs goes from the beginning of John's gospel until chapter 13, and then the book of glory which speak, begins with the Last Supper and Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection is the second part of all that. But in the, the first half of John's Gospel, in the Book of Signs, uh, he gives us some significant stories where people live their faith. You know, he's the one who gives us the story of the, the couple at the wedding feast of Cana. And he also focuses on John the Baptist. And he focuses on the woman at the well. And he focuses on the large crowd of people that came for the multiplication of the loaves and fish. He takes a look at the woman who's caught in adultery. He takes a look at the man who was born blind. He takes a look at Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. And in all of those instances, you know, there is a change of heart. Whereas the story ends, the people are different than they were when the story began. And the reason why John wrote the gospel that way is that all the readers of it would come to see that faith is something that we need to live. Not just think about, but it needs to be put into action. And so today we're going to take a look at another one of those characters from that, the book of signs in John's gospel, who is Nicodemus. Now, you know, there are a couple things that we know about uh, Nicodemus. You know, we know that uh, he was a Pharisee. And from the story, what we know is that, G that he comes to visit Jesus at night. But unlike the other Pharisees, Nicodemus is not out to get Jesus. 
When he comes to visit him, uh, he's not out to try to uh, get Jesus into trouble with the civil authorities. He's coming because he's searching. He's heard an awful lot about what Jesus has said and done, and he's attracted to it. But at that particular time, he does not want to know people about his questioning. And so he comes before the Lord, seeking really to come to know who Jesus is. And he's not disappointed. Because the Lord, in a very particular way, um, lays it out. Lays it out before Nicodemus about who he is, Jesus, as the Son of God, and what he has in fact come to be able to do. And what we know about Nicodemus is that he went away from that visit at night, and we still don't know where he is. But when we get to the very end of John's Gospel, we find out that, well, it took time. As Nicodemus really came to know Jesus, he came out into the open. He went public, if you will. And if you check at the very end of John's Gospel, you're going to see that Nicodemus was there when Jesus was taken down from the cross. Unlike the majority of Jesus' apostles, Nicodemus was there in public. And, uh, and what he did was he gave uh, beautiful oil that he placed on the body of Jesus after he was taken down on the cross. So how did all that happen in, in Nicodemus' life? Well, I'd like to propose that uh, how Nicodemus was able to uh, really come out public to be a follower of Jesus is uh, because he came to realize from the conversation that he had with Jesus in the gospel recounted for today, he came to see how much God believed in him, how much Jesus believed in Nicodemus. And as he reflected on that, he uh, knew that now he was going to have to demonstrate that he would also place his belief in Jesus as the Son of God who came to save the world. I think something else that happened is that as Nicodemus was thinking about that, that line that we read in, in John 3.16, he came to see it not just generally for all people who would believe, but he understood the words of Jesus applied to him. You know, God so loved me that he gave his only son so that I might not perish but might have eternal life. He began to see that Jesus came and he was the savior for him as Jesus would come to save everybody else. Well, you know, I think it's really important for us to be able to take a look at the challenge that, that we're faced with in this gospel to see how willing we are to carry that sign of John 3.16 as it applies to us. And how can we do that? Because you know as well as I do, you know, we're not always as forthright about our belief in Jesus as we should be. If we were, we wouldn't say some of the things that we say. We wouldn't use some of the words that we use. We wouldn't be shy about even praying in public. For example, being at restaurants when we, we boldly, you know, we'll pray uh, grace before meals. We might not be so shy about working against the evils of prejudice, or we might not be so backward about standing up for the absolute value of human life, beginning from the moment of conception to the point of natural death. We might not at all be hesitant in a society that seems to be turning its back on God, to be the ones who point the way to God. And some of you may remember the very famous philosopher Nietzsche said, the problem with you Christians, and he was, he was a sharp critic of Christianity, he said, the problem with you Christians is that you don't look saved. You're not living your faith. Your words, your deeds, your intentions don't show what your faith is all about. And so it seems to me, my sisters and brothers, that as we are now halfway through our season of Lent, and if we haven't begun to do it yet, we, like Nicodemus, need to first come to know Jesus better. We need to come to learn more about him in the scriptures. 
We need to set aside more time to pray to him, to value the beauty of what we do at Holy Mass, to come to appreciate the mysteries of his life in the Holy Rosary, to take a look at other devotions that touch our hearts and bring us closer to him. And most important of all, we need to take those quiet moments when it's just between you and me and Jesus so that we can come to feel his presence. And it seems to me that if you and I are willing to do that, then the same thing that happened to Nicodemus is going to happen to us. Just as Nicodemus went public for Jesus, we can do the very same thing. We can be very proud of our faith and demonstrate it in the words that we use and that we use about each other. In the actions that we do out of service for others and in the way that we live that points the direction to the reality that there is a God and we're ever so proud to advance the mission. And it seems to me that one of the ways that we can do that is to think about that line, John 3, 16, and think to ourselves in the same way that Nicodemus looked at that line. God so loved me, each of us as individuals, that he gave his only begotten son so that I might not perish, but might have eternal life. One of the ways in which you and I can be a contradiction to the statement of Nietzsche is to look saved. And one of the beautiful ways in which we come to look saved is to realize we can't save ourselves. One person did that for us and with an endless love, our dear Jesus. I'd like to close today with a, a beautiful part of uh, the Eucharistic prayer for reconciliation that we're going to use for Mass today. And it points the attention on Jesus, the same Jesus who met Nicodemus, and the same Jesus whom we come to meet in our own day by realizing something beautiful about Jesus believing in us so that we in turn can believe more in him. And it's these words, God's love for us is so tight that it can never be undone. Thank God for that kind of love. May that kind of love help you and me to live for sure. John 316.